And welcome. This episode of Amen Podcast is called Judgment. Alex will be preaching about God's judgment in the kingdom of heaven as we continue our series in Matthew. We're looking at chapter 13, verses 47 through 50. Um, we'll be in the ESV version. I will go ahead and read those verses. If you have your Bibles, please open them now. Here you go. Here's your Bible. While we do that, while you turn to there, uh, if you'd like to support this channel, this this podcast is completely supported by listeners like you. You can go to amenpodcast.com. Thank you for joining us on the side of the road on our beautiful island. It's about to rain, so we're going to read the scripture and then we're going to get into the van so we don't get soaking wet. Let's get into it. <laughs> Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing. Amen. Let's get into it. In this episode, we're going to talk about why we need judgment, the problem in judgment, and lastly, the solution of judgment. So in the first two verses, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted good, the good into containers and threw away the bad. So in this passage, the word bad actually means rotten. And he, Jesus is using the example of something that they would have seen all the time, and that is fishing. The rotten fish were useless. They were worthless. And so they would throw away them into the trash because they were worthless. And we're going to see what Jesus likens that to, but he's talking about the judgment. And most importantly, what happens when God's judgment comes down and that day is coming. But Jesus uses an illustration that they would have really known and seen all the time, especially those who live next to the Sea of Galilee. Back then, and still today, there was three main ways of fishing. The first one is the line and the hook, right? The fisherman goes, gets a line, throws it in the water, hooks a fish, brings it in. We see this in Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus tells Peter to go and catch a fish and the temple tax was inside of the fish's mouth. It's a really cool miracle. And Matthew 17, another way of fishing is uh, the word ephemistrom, ephemistrom. Sorry, I got to work on my Hebrew guys, but it's basically the idea of throwing net. And in Hawaii, um, that's one of the major ways of fishing, especially in the old days. Uh, one or two guys take a fit, take a net with weights on the bottom, toss it out and over a school of fish and the weights drop down onto a school of fish and it traps the fish. And then you pull the line and all the fish are inside of the net. It's a really cool um, thing to watch. And if you go to almost any, you know, any uh, good beach here with good fishing, you might be able to see some uncle or maybe an auntie out there fishing. It's a really cool thing to watch. The last way is the way that uh, Jesus is talking about in our parable today. And it's the word sagene. And it's the idea of a huge net, like the size of a wall. And there's two ways to do it. You can have two boats, uh, weights at the bottom of the net and the top of the net held onto the boats and they make a giant circle and they catch everything in the path of the net. The way that Jesus is describing here is the way with only one boat where you would moor the net onto the shore and then the boat would take a huge circle sweeping everything in its path. Those weights would drag along the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, which is really just a giant lake, and it would just catch everything in its path. This is uh, also called a drag net. And it permitted nothing to escape. It swept everything in its path. This parable was meant to show us that life is going somewhere, that the suffering and the evil that we encounter isn't meaningless. There's a time coming when God will deal with it all. What that means is a lot of religions teach that life is circular and that life just keeps on going and going and going and going around and around and again. Uh, a baby's born, baby meets. 
another baby gets married, not babies, baby grows up, you know, does school and stuff like that, meets someone, falls in love, has a baby, and it just keeps on going around and around in circles. And life is just kind of that way. You know, you get old, you die, you get old, you die, you get older. You know, it just the same things over and over again. And there's really no meaning to it. It's just circular. And when the lights turn out, it's out. That's it. What Christianity teaches is unlike any other religion or philosophy out there. What Christianity teaches is that life is going somewhere. Life is a highway, like they sing in the in the movie Cars. It's going somewhere, and there's an end to the road. It's a straight line headed towards something. In our parable today, Jesus is saying where we're headed is eternity's shore. That God, whether we like it or not, God is drawing all of us inside of His net and pulling us towards his shore, whether we know it or not, or whether we like it or not, or whether we think we can get away from it or not, we can't. He's pulling us towards eternity's shore. Now, what he's gonna separate on that last day when we get to the shore is the bad fish from the good fish. We're gonna talk about that in our next point, looking at the problem in judgment. But I want you to look at Leviticus 11, nine through 11. Leviticus 11, nine through 11. This even gives us more context of what the idea of good fish versus bad fish means. You may eat any kind of fish that has fins and scales, but anything living in the water that does not have fins and scales must not be eaten. Such creatures must be considered unclean. You must not eat them or even touch their dead bodies. Amen. And so the idea of good fish and bad fish would have been in these these Jewish hearers mind because of this verse in Leviticus. There was things that uh, Jewish people were allowed to eat by God and weren't allowed to eat. Commentators have debated on the reason why. Um, you can debate about it too. It's really not important. The main reason why God tell them God told them to eat certain food and not eat certain food was to remind them that they're different than the surrounding non-believers. They're surround the their surrounding people that they would see all the time were um, non-Jewish, pagan, worshiped other gods, worshiped in heinous ways. God wanted to constantly remind them that you're not like those people, you're different. And that's a good thing to be reminded of. And so the idea of good fish and bad fish, this would have like contextually, they would have known exactly what Jesus is talking about. And the fact that Jesus is going to judge our life and separate us into good fish and bad fish that gives meaning to our life. It means that we're going somewhere. It doesn't mean um, that life keeps going on and on and on forever, but there's an end coming. So there's two ways you can deal with this. Like if you just think that life is circular, there's really no meaning, and then one thing happens, another thing happens, and then it starts all over again. There's two ways to really handle that. You can handle it like hedonistically or, or narcissistically. And you're never going to find a hedonist who's not narcissistic. You're never not, you're never going to find a narcissist who's not a hedonist. And what a hedonist is, is someone who lives for pleasure. A narcissist um, is someone who wants others to live for them and they control everything. And so if you think that life has no meaning, it's just circular and we just die and the lights go out and that's it. And it just starts over for someone and it ends for somebody else. You're just going to think that I can just do whatever I want, whatever feels good, whatever, you know, Life doesn't have any meaning. You know, there's no judgment day coming. I can just do whatever feels good. Um, But then your life has no meaning. You're just living for the next thing, the next pleasure. What happens when that pleasure runs out? What happens when the one thing that gave you pleasure doesn't give you pleasure anymore? Or you can look at it as, you know, well, in this life, I am a businessman. And this guy, he's just a homeless man. He's not as important as I am, you know, and life is circular. You know, this is just the cards I was dealt. This is just, you know, luck of the draw. I am this, he is that. So in that case, you're more important than him. Your, your life is more valuable than his life. And we would never say that out loud, but that is kind of how we live when we think that there's no judgment day coming. When we think that we know it's right, that's narcissistic. When we think, when we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, I am living the right way and, and this person, that person, that person is not living the right way. What you're saying is, you know, this is just how life always is. This is how I've always been. And there's nothing really going to change. It's just, this is just how it happens generation after generation. This is, this is luck of the draw. This is just uh, natural selection. It's all pointing towards the same thing. And that is a circular meaningless life. But if somebody is going in a straight line towards an end goal, that means we're going to be held accountable for what we do here in this life. And that day can, like we could be uh, in shallow water right now. If we look back at our parable, the the net is sweeping through deep water and then it gets closer and closer to the 
the beach until it's all the way on the sand in the shore. What if we are in shallow water right now? You know, maybe judgment day could be tomorrow. It could be before we even post this episode. Judgment gives meaning for why life is the way it is. But what about who this judgment is for? We know judgment is coming because uh, God in his justice and his righteousness has to deal with all evil. He has to handle it. And that day is coming. Why else? If there's, if life is circular, what's the point of all the bad things that happen in our life? There's no meaning to all suffering, all evil, unless life is like a straight line and it's heading towards a day where God is going to do away with it. So let's look at the problem in judgment. And that is separation. Verse 49, it says, so it'll be in the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. So in Matthew 24, uh, 31 and Matthew 25, 31 through 32 and Revelation 14, 19 and Revelation 15, 9, 5 through 16 and verse 21. Those are all examples of when angels are used as agents of God. Agents to do what? Agents of separation and execution. This is part of their job to execute and separate. He's already mentioned this in uh, Matthew 13, in the parable of the wheat and the tares. So why is he talking about it again, this scene where these angels are separating the wicked from the righteous? Well, first of all, it's a vital thing for us to understand, like to to lay in bed at night and to know there's a day coming where the angels are going to be called upon by Jesus to separate the evil from the wicked. That's so important for you to understand for your spiritual health. But at the same time, it's different in this parable. At first glance, you could think this is just the same parable of the wheat and the tares earlier in chapter 13. And you know, we talked about a couple episodes ago, just with different characters, bad fish and good fish. But they, the point in the wheat and the tares parable was the wicked and the righteous coexisting at the same time until the end of the age, until judgment day. What this parable is about is their separation, the separation of the two. Jesus is not giving a full description of the last days, but rather he's focusing on the judgment of unbelievers, which is commonly called a passing car. Now, the final judgment of the great white throne when all things will pass away. And, you know, if you're wicked, you're going to wish you were in a car drive, driving fast enough to get away from what's next. And we're, we're going to get into, like, we're going to talk about hell in a little bit, and it's really going to blow your mind on how deep and dark hell really is, but it's also going to show you how great God's love is in the midst of that. So Revelation 20, 11 through 15, um, it's kind of a lengthy little passage, but you have to get this picture of what the white throne judgment looks like. You've probably read this before, but it's at the very end of your Bible. And we get a picture from Jesus to John, one of Jesus' closest friends while he was on earth, John, the disciple, John, the apostle, of what that last day will look like. It's called the final judgment at the great white throne. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Amen. So what a heavy scene, right? Where God uh, is sitting on the throne. He's in complete control. And the separation of those who know God, love God, do not know God, hate God, are being separated. And it's God is throwing literal, literal death itself and Hades itself into the lake of fire with all those demons and angels, uh, fallen angels that rebelled against him and everyone who rebelled against God. This is the lake of fire. This is like fire is used all the time when, when, when talking about hell and it's a sign of judgment, you know, and, and we're going to get into three reasons 
why Jesus talked about this day, the great white throne judgment so often. He talked about it a lot, guys. In fact, he talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. And that means we need to think about it more than we want to think about it. So there's three reasons why he, at least three reasons, I'm sorry, why he talked about it so much. Number one is that we're dense, right? If you look at Matthew 24, 38, 40 through 41, it says in those last days, in the days of Noah, people were eating and drinking and going about their business. What does that mean? What Jesus is trying to say by bringing that up is that in the days of Noah, people were incredibly dense. Like Noah was telling them there's going to be a flood. God's going to judge us. You got to get in the boat. You got to listen to me. And they were dense. They kept on partying, drinking, having a good time. Not that anything's wrong with eating, drinking, and partying when it's done the right way. But when it's done, when God is saying, stop doing that. And I want you to focus on this right now. Don't just keep on doing it. When I'm trying to talk to you about something that's really important, then we're being dense. And so he knew how dense we were as humans. And he was like, you got to hear about hell and what I'm trying to save you from. The second reason why Jesus talked about this so much, at least one of the second reasons here, is that he dotes on us. To dote on someone is to be very, very fond of, extremely, so super loud truck with a trailer, super uh, fond of, extremely fond of. You know, you just, you, you are deeply in love with this person. Luke 19, 41. Do you want to read that for us? Sure. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. This is Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, wanting Jerusalem to turn to him. And Jerusalem as a city, as a people would not turn to him. And he's weeping over it. Weeping is what you see a mother do who lost their 13 year old son uh, to a drunk driver at a funeral. That's weeping. It's not just a little tear down your eyes. It's like convulsing. It's uh, snot nosed. It's uh, makeup running. It, not that Jesus wore makeup. We're talking about a mom here. But it's just, it's just this heavy, 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 deeply emotional, bodily crying. And that's what Jesus was doing, weeping over Jerusalem. Why? He loved them. He doted on them. These are his people. He feels the same way about you. That's why he talks about hell so much. In fact, if you don't talk about hell as a pastor, as a Christian, can you really call yourself a believer? Can you really say, can you really say you love these people? If you don't talk about hell, think about hell often. And lastly, uh, one of the at least three reasons why Jesus talked about hell so much was uh, designation, designation. And John 25, 41 shows us this. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So here we see Jesus say that hell was not prepared for humans. Mm. It was designated for the devil and his angels. It's not a place for us. He talks about hell so much because he doesn't want us to go there because we don't belong there. It's not for us. It was designed for someone else. When we think about, you know, hell, it can be sobering, but the judgment of God will separate those who love him from those who do not, the bad fish from the good fish. Which group will you be in? To be a good fish, we must understand, repent, and believe in the gospel. And that's not saying we have to do something. That's not saying that our our doing, our works get us in there. God is the one that gives us the ability to understand these things in the first place. Ephesians 2 tells us that faith to believe in God is a gift that God gives to us, but then you're held accountable. The Bible doesn't really talk about free will. Other religions talk about free will. Christianity talks about accountability. Accountability means you're going to be held accountable for the decisions that you make. It, it, it says you can make decisions. Do we have the ability to just control everything in our life and absolutely work freely in our will apart from any uh, influence from God? Of course not. God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. That's what it means to be God. But we do have accountability. He does give us the power to make choices. And so what we must do is something that we can only do with his help. And that is understand, repent, and believe in the gospel so that we don't end up like one of these bad fish about to get thrown into the trash. Now, what is the trash? All this is impossible to understand or to take in or to believe or to let it move you or to give you meaning unless you have a proper view of hell. So let's get into the solution of judgment. 
a solution of judgment, which is hell. In verse 50, it says, and throw them into the fiery furnace. This is what the angels are going to do to the bad fish, you know, which we know are those who don't love God, don't know God, don't submit to God, rebel against God. In that place, Jesus says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth in Matthew 13, verse 50. So understanding how terrible hell is gives us the ability to know how good God is, how holy he is, and how in need of him we are. So here's four things that we need to know about hell, at least four things. There's way more, but I think these four things are a good place to start uh, because in my John MacArthur commentary, these are the four things that he brought out. And he gave us a bunch of verses. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the verses, but we're not going to read all of them because this will be a two-hour podcast. But the first reason is hell is a place of constant torment, misery, and pain. Now, you can see this in Mark 9, 43, if you want to write that down in your notes. But you can also um, see it in Matthew twenty-two, 13. I'll read this one. Mm-hmm. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness in that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is using another parable here and he says that hell is going to be filled with outer darkness. We don't have time to get into the fact that a lot of people think that when Jesus is talking about hell, it's metaphorical. Like I said, that's time for another podcast. We don't have time to get into it. This just know it's not metaphorical because of how often he talks about it. He repeats himself over and over and over and over and over again. And if it was just metaphorical, he wouldn't have to say it that many times. Mm. This is a real place. And it's it's throughout different books. Like we said right now, it's in Revelation. It's in the Gospels. Lots of people corroborating on this idea that hell is a place of torment, misery, and pain. Now, outer darkness is interesting because how is how is hell dark and yet hellfire? Where there's fire, there's light right? Does that mean it's metaphorical because it doesn't line up? No, it means it's spiritual. It means there's some mystery going on here. Somehow it's completely dark and yet on fire. It's a place of constant torment, misery, and pain. Now let's look at the second, uh, second little fact about hell. And that is hell will involve the torment of both the body and the soul. You can see this in Mark 9, 48 and Matthew 10, 28, and also in John 5, 29, which she's, which uh, Loki Lani is going to read. And come out those who have done good to, to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So Jesus is talking about the resurrection of the dead and he actually says in the resurrection of the dead, there's going to be two groups. Those who resurrect, who've been given resurrected bodies to go to heaven, to enjoy paradise, enjoy eternity forever. And those who are going to be given resurrected bodies to enjoy, I'm sorry, excuse me, not enjoy, to endure, not even endure. How do you even say this? They're going to be given resurrected bodies that don't, that cannot be destroyed in hell. They will feel pain. They will feel constant torment. They will feel misery in their bodies and in their souls, but they won't be consumed with it. I mean, physically consumed. And at the same time, they will be physically consumed. And this is why I say it's spiritual because they're going to be going through something so horrible. And their hope would be, but at some at some point I'm going to burn up and I'm going to just be char and ashes, right? No. In this, in this resurrected body that they have, they're still going to be experiencing pain forever. It's a bodily and soul torment. Mm. Now, the, the third point here is hell will be experienced in varying degrees. Varying degrees. So you can see this in Matthew eleven twenty two 22 through 23, Hebrews 10, 28 through 29. Uh, but Loke is going to read um, Luke 12, 47 and 48. And the servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom which was given of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand more. Amen. And so what Jesus is saying here is... 
there is different uh, varying degrees in hell. Like the the person who knew what to do and did what was deserved a beating, he got a severe beating. But the person that did not know but still did what deserved a beating got a lighter beating. What Jesus is saying here is there's varying degrees in hell. Like people are going to experience hell in different ways and different degrees. And so um, this idea is kind of thought out in, um, I believe it's, is it paradise loss or is it Dante's Inferno? Very good. That's why it pays to have a smart wife. And Dante's Inferno, there's varying degrees of hell. We see that. And when I read that, I was like, oh, that's not in it. That's not, everyone's going to get the same punishment, right? That's not what he just said right here. Or in Matthew 12, 22 to 23 or Hebrews 10, 28 to 29. There's varying degrees. No one put it better. I've seen so far than John Gerstner, who said hell will have such severe degrees that a sinner were he able would give the whole world. If his sins could be one less one, he would give the whole world because of how severe the degrees are. He would give the whole world. If his sins could be one Less. Let me just move up to a different degree. He would give the whole world. That's crazy, guys. The last point is hell will be everlasting. Matthew 25 through 46 and says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal. That's what it is. Everlasting. That's what hell is. There is no getting out. Again, this Puritan writer, John Bunyan, describes hell uh, in his customary vivid imagery. And he said it best. He says in hell, thou shalt have none, but a company of damned souls with an innumerable, innumerable company of devils to keep company with thee. While thou art in this world, the very thought of the devils appearing to thee makes thy flesh to tremble and thy hair ready to stand upright on thy head. But, oh, what wilt thou do? What wilt thou do when not only the supposition of the devil's appearing, but the real society of all devils of hell will be with thee, howling, roaring, and screeching in such a hideous manner that thou wilt be even at thy wits end and ready to run stark mad again for anguish and tor torment. If after 10,000 years an end should come, there would be comfort, but here in thy misery, here thou must be forever. When thou seest what an innumerable portion, what an innumerable company of howling devils thou art amongst, thou shalt think this again. This is my portion forever. When thou hast been in hell so many thousand years, as there are stars in the firmament or drops in the sea or sands on the sand shore, yet thou hast to lie there forever. Oh, this one word. Ever, how will it torment thy soul? To the degree that you let view shape your mind is the degree that you're going to love God and understand how good the gospel is. Ever, the word ever will torment your soul for eternity. Because like he said, if it was just a 10,000 year punishment, that would be such a great comfort. But it's not. There is no getting out of it. Do you understand why Jesus talked about this so much? Do you understand why we can't afford to go any longer without thinking about it often? Hell is something that you should think about a lot. Jesus saved you from eternal torment by taking it for you because he loves you. Yeah. This is what you, this is what you, you know, the switch comes on. When you look at how deep and dark and horrible hell is, and you let it permeate your soul, you can't, you have to go, you can't, you got to go one step further. One step further is knowing that that's not enough motivation in and of itself. It will not motivate you to live for God. You can know how bad hell is and still live like hell. What motivates you is the fact that Jesus took hell on your behalf. He switched places with you. Okay. On the cross, Jesus was treated as a wicked, Jesus was treated as wicked and separated from God so you could be declared righteous in judgment and united with God. Jesus took an eternal amount of punishment for you so you could receive eternal life from God. And because he was innocent and perfect, God rose him from the dead as a sign of what is to come for those who are in Christ. He switched places with you. Everything that we just read about hell makes it terrifying. And all of it was felt 
on your behalf. The separation of the Son of God from the Father, turning his face away. He switched places with you to the degree that you understand that and see that it'll transform you into a new creation. It'll transform the way you see others. And that's what the application is for this message. The application is, I want you to touch the net. Say that to yourself, touch the net, touch the net. What that means is these, these fish, as they swam in this parable, if we look at the story, when fish are in a net like that, they certainly come across it. They, say, they certainly at some points feel the net push up against them. And if they're the bad fish in this story, they don't care. They're like, okay, whatever. It's just, you know, just a net, you know, or just something that just touched me. But the good fish, if you look even deeper, the good fish know what that net is. They know what this means. If God is pulling you towards eternity, he wants you to think about it often, to swim over to the side of that net that's pulling you towards the shore and touch it and think to myself, what does this mean? If we have escaped eternal punishment, how should our life look? Is it possible for others to be saved? Yes, then how shall, we li- how shall we live? Shall we keep to ourselves? Shall we continue with pet sins? Shall we continue to spend more time online than on our knees and in prayer? Shall we continue to give God our sloppy seconds instead of our first fruits? Touching the net means bringing ourselves to the fact that I was this close to going to hell. I was this close to expen- spending my eternity in torment, but that's what he saved me from by how? by just plucking me out of it? No, by taking it himself for God to be righteous. And the reason why hell is eternal is because God is eternally holy. That is the punishment for going against and rebelling against an eternally holy God. That's the punishment. And he switched with us. If that's true, we got to get up early. We got to stop making excuses. We got to read our Bible. We got to set aside time to pray. If you're not too busy for social media, you're not too busy for God. We got to touch the net. In our, in our culture today, people say touch grass. And it means come to reality. Bring yourself back to the fact that like, you know, you're just a human. And that's a good thing to do. But what's more important than touching grass is touching the net. Loving others means remembering that you've, what you've been saved from and what others need saving from and treating them as valuable to God. Mm. That's what it means to love others. To treat them like God loves them that God values them, touch the net. So the question I have for you today is how does God's judgment impact your life? Father God, we thank you so much for how good you are to us, how sweet and patient you are with us, that you don't want any of us um, to suffer, but you would rather um, take time to send your son son, um, and to give us a chance, Lord. And you're, you're waiting as you're pulling in that net slowly. Only you know the day that it's gonna hit the shore, but you're waiting for us to turn to you. Lord, to turn from bad fish into good fish, something only you can do. In your name we pray, amen. If you're watching on YouTube, we moved outside. And this is the portion of the episode called After the Amen, where we ask you a question to help you apply this message to your life. And Alex's question for us today is, how does God's judgment impact your life? How does God's judgment impact your life? I'll answer first as always, and then we'd love to see your responses in the comments on YouTube, or you can answer on the Q&A section on Spotify. It has affected my life in a great way, right? (laughs) Understatement. (laughs) I know. Um, Wow. I just am like moved to Thanksgiving, like thinking about what he saved us from. Um, and I think like when we become Christians and we trust in the finished work of the cross and we know the like eternal security that we receive, it can be easy to kind of like stop thinking about hell or skip over it or think like we don't need to focus on it. Um, cause one, it may feel very real that what he saved us from, cause I think in some aspects we can what the world would call like hell on earth, you know, we experience that in, in small ways. Sin can be very dark, very damning on earth. Um, but that doesn't even come close to what the eternal judgment will be like. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's so easy for us to kind of like 
want to shy away from thinking about it anymore. But when you think about how it like instead of moving you to fear, especially as a Christian being saved and knowing why hell is there and like what his grace and like what his grace and mercy was there for, like how it saved us from that and how that should move us to compassion and thanksgiving and joy, um, knowing how good a God is that would start send his son to take our place for what we deserved which was hell. He gave us a way out. That's just like so incredible. And I think that we like need to think about it because that is the driving force for compassion. Like, would we want that for anyone else? We hated it when we were stuck in our sin, lonely, depraved, without God. We know the loneliness that that feels like, right? And I think that... um. God's judgment, like, reminds me of my duty um, to serve others and to really be moved to compassion and action. And I think action is, like, repentance, like, in my own life. Like, action is, like, prayer. Like, it can be so easy to just think about how bad a situation is, how evil a person is in your life. And instead of um, moving to action, we move to complacency, which is like gossip or um, like just entertaining our thoughts about the situation or those people. And we think that we're like moved to action because we're doing something and it makes us feel a certain way. But the true action needs to be repentance in our life and prayer for those people in our lives. And of course, sharing the good news with them. Um, And I just think I love what you said about the designation of hell. Like it wasn't designed for us. And I think that's like so beautiful and it really shows you the heart of the Lord. And it reminds me of second Peter three, nine, And it says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And we should have that same heartbeat. Like we should have that same view of the world. I think it's easy to be like, oh, you know, they're too far gone. Like, I'm just going to give up now. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, we have to remove people from our lives but that prayer for those people should never stop like our example of loving Christ should never stop when they come across us and how we um interact with them how we interact with others it should move us to compassion it should move us to be merciful people and we should just desire that we should have the desires of the Lord that none should perish like these people have these people, including us, have offended a holy God, not us. Yet we are the ones who don't. We are the ones who are okay with them perishing. That's just so backwards. It's so wrong. And so I think that's, yeah, God's judgment just helps me love others more. And it helps me just feel so thankful for what he's done. Um, because honestly, like, so undeserving of that. Jesus was perfect. Jesus is the only one who deserved not even to experience a pinch of what hell is. Yet he took it on our behalf on the cross so that we could live freely and we could share the good news with others and not just be complacent. That's beautiful. It does move you. Like, because especially when you know, when you really think about that, he took that for you. It moves you, you know, and if you... If you say, well, I can't believe in a God that would do that, you know, well, you believe in a very small God. If you believe in a God that uh, has eternal punishment awaiting those who rebel against him, for those who choose it, then you also believe in a God who is infinitely rich in mercy, infinitely rich in grace, that he would send his son. Mm -hmm. My son asked me this week, how do we know God loves us? Jesus. Mm -hmm. He sent his son. Mm -hmm. For God so loved us, the world, that he gave his son. He infinitely gave to us something that is unspeakable, you know, and, and you can't even begin to grasp that unless you start to see his judgment, um, played out in scripture. Uh, it's all throughout the old Testament, 
Why? Because he's holy. Not because he's mean or he's angry or he's having a bad day or he's like a, a cosmic kid with a magnifying glass just burning us up like little ants. It's because he's beautifully holy, deeply holy. And that's the only proper response to rebelling against a God like that. Mm-hmm. That's hard for us to understand because we, we have such a small view of God. And that's why hell is necessary. That's why judgment gives us meaning because the more you look at it, the more you start to see how big and great God really is and how good he is that it wasn't designed for us. Yeah. So you can go on and on and on about this, but um, we love you guys. We want to hear your answers. Thank you so much for joining us for this little camp out um, expedition episode. We love you and we'll see you in the next one. Yes. And until then, go out and be the church. Amen.